Casey DeSantis, I'm like, oh, you don't trip and fall in love with a white supremacist, anti-trans, no. homophobic man. Mm-hmm. Like you have to have some alignment there. So I think yeah. we should be asking Choices. those questions too. Well, mm-hmm. and so much alignment because he has no charisma and seems like the least Zero. charming He's person on the planet. Oh. So. <laughs> And welcome back. You're listening to Hysteria, which is a safe space for the people we like. Speaking of two people we like, Alyssa, let's just bring in our panel right away because this is going to be a fun day. Our first panelist is a political strategist, opinion writer, MSNBC political analyst, and host of Crooked's What A Day podcast. Evidently, she can do it all. Juanita (laughs) Tolliver, welcome to Hysteria. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for having me. I'm ready to fuck some shit up. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes, that is the energy we need today. Our next panelist is Crooked's VP of Politics. She and her team are working to raise money to fight anti-trans legislation with Vote Save America's Fuck Bans Leave Queer Kids Alone Fund. You know her, you love her. Shaniqua McClendon, welcome back to Hysteria. Hi, thank you for having me. These are like three of my favorite ladies. So I'm really yes. excited. <laughs> this is a fun group. If only we could be like in IRL in one studio. I know. Imagine. Imagine. <laughs> Imagine the shit that would get fucked up <laughs> under those Imagine the state of the studio after we left it. So. <laughs> <laughs> we would be like an 80s hair metal band, except with like yeah. leaving things nicer than when we first got there. Um, I feel like we're all yes. we're a conscientious group. Okay, so I really wanted to talk about political spouses and political, you know, plus ones, if you will, because a few weeks ago, there was a post on uh, Politico that got a lot of flack about Casey DeSantis. And it sort of hit all of the familiar sour notes that we're used to when we read profiles of political spouses, uh, where it's like, this person is the politician's secret weapon or behind the scenes they're quietly pulling the levers and I'm not defending Casey DeSantis in any way shape or form because I I don't know her and she seems bad but she seems like she's got some defenders so she's like she's got she's she's got some defenders some of which are bots but what I'm what I would like to do instead is attack the form of the political the way that we talk about political spouses, because I used to have this editor when I worked at the Daily Beast, uh, Jackie Kucinich, who is uh, still kind of in the political media game. She's a great lady, um, but she used to automatically kill any pitch that tried to to paint a political spouse as the politician's secret weapon because she found it to be very lazy. And that's something that I've internalized. I, I find that to be lazy as well. But despite the fact that 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 positioning of the political spouse is kind of lazy. There's no denying the fact that political spouses are super powerful, both as, you know, policy forces and cultural forces. You know, we have um, Eleanor Roosevelt used to write a newspaper column called My Day, which was published Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday. Imagine writing a column. Uh, not me. Dick. Not no, me. Not gonna do it. Especially not in 1939. But okay. <laughs> I know. Did well, they have I feel typewriters like they, then? I think Probably the typewriters not. were like <laughs> they would make your fingers buff because like the actual yeah it was like weight training for your fingers. <laughs> it, it ran Monday through Friday, uh, which is basically like a you know 1930s Substack um, or 1940s Substack. And, you know, then we had other people who were genuinely weird in the White House, like Florence Harding was super weird. She was a, a big believer in the occult. Wasn't she also a teenager? I feel like, did I get that wrong about Harding marrying a teenager? Okay. Yeah. Neither nor there. The times. Florence <laughs> Harding was super, Florence Harding was the one that was old. She was 60, old. Okay. She was okay. 61. Okay, my bad. Um, when she went into the White House and she was like obsessed with the occult, like she had a she had a clairvoyant. A lot of people were obsessed with the account back then, you know, to be fair. But she had a clairvoyant named Madame Marcia read her Zodiac and the and Madame Marcia would like go into trances and warn Florence of anyone in the administration who was like out to get her husband. Yeah. You know, <laughs> just a side of paranoia to start your day. Okay. <laughs> I mean, nothing like when the Ouija board is front and center. I Yikes. Yeah. There's there's something that's kind of like charming and old timey about that era's um, obsession with the occult and like clairvoyance and, you know, uh, seances and stuff. But, you know, also Nancy Reagan had a White House 
astrologer. Um, but then on the, the more serious side and the more cultural side, like Michelle Obama, every time she wore anything in public that was off the rack, it would go completely out of stock. Yeah. 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 She made, I mean, she made Philip Lim. Like, <laughs> like she did. 100%. And I remember when she, she wore something from White House Black Market and yep. that I can I can yeah. picture that dress. <laughs> <laughs> was there, there was one... some J Crew stuff, right? That yeah, like, that was the J. inauguration. Yeah, and Sasha and Malia wore J Crew for the inaugur the first inauguration. I'm and into we all it. we all remember it. Like that's that's yeah. like impact. I mean, look, I I think that there the two we can hold two ideas at once, which is that it's more important to pay attention to like what's going on in policy in the country, and also that first ladies and political spouses are massively influential, regardless of whether they're influencing policy. Um, my favorite first lady anecdote is on the campaign trail in 1992, before she had her own like front and center political career. Hillary Clinton um, was just like a groovy lady who had like. You know, who had who had her own thoughts and her own feelings. And and that made a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, she had a quote during a press gaggle uh, that was uh, somebody asked about her career. And she said, you know, I suppose I could have stayed home and baked cookies and had teas. But what I decided to do was fulfill my profession, which I entered before my husband was in public life. And I tried very, very hard to be as careful as possible. And that's all I can tell you. So, do you guys remember this? I guess maybe the, some of this crowd is too old, but Alyssa, do you remember this? <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Of course I remember. Of course. I probably wrote a book report on it, Erin. <laughs> do you remember the, like, fallout after it happened? I don't remember the fallout. I just remember thinking that at the... So, when Clinton ran, I was... I was a sophomore junior in, in high school. And it was just for all of our like little nerdy, politically aware kids whose parents made them watch the nightly news and talk about it over dinner. We just thought she was the coolest, you know, like because before that, the real memories you had about political spouses were like Nancy Reagan and the astrologer, uh, Nancy Reagan and Dare, and then Barbara Bush and Geraldine Ferraro getting into a fight, you know, like it's. <laughs> oh, yeah. Barbara well, that came Bush. later, but still. Barbara yeah. Bush, the first lady who most seemed like she would whack you with a purse. Yes. <laughs> yeah, guys, my favorite piece of trivia about Barbara Bush is that her Secret Service code name when uh, Bush was vice president was Snowbank. If oh. that doesn't say it all. I don't like, understand. You have to break this down. Yeah. I'm black and I'm from the South. I don't get it. What is that? <laughs> snowbank means that she's tough. She's, she's a fucking tough. snowbank. She's, she's a unmovable. Oh. Okay. Okay. Look, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> She'll oh, stop you in well. your tracks. Got it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly right. They might as well have named her Brick Shit House. I mean, <laughs> period. That, Just yep. say what you want to say. That like, if exactly. that's the point. <laughs> but when you think about it, Hillary, I think Hillary Clinton's code name was Evergreen. And she did remain somewhat evergreen and uh, relevant for the rest of her life. Who comes up with these names? Eh, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Most of them are reflective of something in their history, something that they either like or have an affin like an affinity for or that's like keen, uh, relevant to their background. Okay. Mm. Interesting. Mm. Well, so after Hillary Clinton made that comment in 1992, there was like the 1992 equivalent of like a shitstorm because people who, you know, you, you know how it's sort of like just a bad faith contest every time anybody says anything in the political space. Um, and uh, yeah, in 1992, people got really upset that she said she could have stayed home and baked cookies. And so... As a way to make up for that gaffe, which I don't even think was a, a oh gaffe. Oh, God. Please don't yeah. say she hosted a tea party and baked some fucking cookies. Did she? She started the First Lady <laughs> Cookie Bake Off. <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. It, be it was because America was extremely on. I mean, is continues. America has never not been extremely unchill, but America was extremely unchill about that comment that Hillary Clinton made just during a, a press gaggle in the in 1992. And so as a result, she started the first ever White House, like First Lady Cookie Bake Off, which continues to this day. And in 2016, um, Bill Clinton actually had to submit his cookie recipe. <laughs> yes, he was the he was, you know, cause oh. Hillary was running for president. 
So, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's like these these moments of, of, you know, when we talk about first spouses or when we talk about political partners that sort of like end up either reflect both reflecting and causing like cultural movement. And so like Juanita, what's your favorite and most memorable like first spouse moment? <laughs> I don't I feel like I'm not sure if it's a moment. There's like two things and themes. Let's go with themes. My favorite um, first lady theme for uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who we already mentioned, is how she stood up for black people. Like she stood up for one black person in particular in a very public way. I'm talking about Marion um, Marian Anderson, the opera singer who was looking to perform. She was like, you know, affiliated with Howard University. Their venue after venue were like, nope, nope, you can't do it here. They went to DAR. DAR was like, no, Eleanor Roosevelt took her little My Day column and read those racist heifers for filth. And then she made it happen so that Marian Anderson could perform on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Like that is why I fuck it's with It's amazing. Her. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. stepping up to call out your own peoples. I'm here for it. I need I need more of that in my life every day. The other theme I want to emphasize, I know we talked about Michelle LaVon Robinson Obama's sweaters, but I want to talk about the way she stood up in her relationship, because we know she bent herself and her path multiple times for her husband, who we all know and love. But she did bend. But what she didn't bend on is a firm understanding and awareness of who she was at a human level. And that's what I appreciate most. Like, yes, the representation is great. The fashion is great. Her stature is great. But she fully understood exactly who she was. And I would I would say that grounded Barack Obama while he was in the White House to a degree so that she served as that North Star. But it also came through in all of her projects that she's pursuing now. Like that is a theme that I think we can all learn from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh, waffles and mochi is the most comforting. I love waffles yeah. and mochi. <laughs> I was watching waffles and mochi before I even like had a child to like watch it with, and she's Bless. not even old enough to really. She like likes the puppets, like she doesn't understand what's going on or whatever. But I'm sort of like, look, like you shouldn't be encouraging a child to watch TV. But I'm like, hey, you want to watch waffles and mochi? With this me? is where you can get your screen time because yes. it's worth it. Yes, a hundred percent. Wow, um, I have never even heard of that, but oh. noted. <laughs> Next we got to bring you up to speed. Oh my God. Oh, Shaniqua. It is two Children's puppets. programming, where are you? Puppets who work in a grocery store where Michelle Obama also works. And the puppets fly around the world exploring different types of foods and the way that they're used in different types of cuisines. And it is a delight. There is like true zero notes. They go to Peru to examine potatoes. I will talk more offline. I'll I'll like send you my favorite waffles and mochi episode. It's so good. Um, Shaniqua, on that note, what are your favorite kind of high notes when it comes to, I guess, instead of like just first ladies, like just political partners? Because this is, you know, Casey DeSantis is not the first lady. That is a cursed thought. How did we jump there already? (laughs) Um, It is a cursed thought. But I think that in any presidential campaign, they cover the spouses as potential first ladies. So that's kind of how it all kind of fits together. So what are your what are your high notes when it comes to um, political spouse moments? Yeah, well, Juanita definitely um, took uh, the person I wanted to f- reflect on a little. So I'll just add a little bit more and then and then throw in someone else. But um, similarly to what Juanita said, like Michelle Obama really standing in who she was, the fact that she, you know, had an advanced degree, she had two Ivy League degrees and did not like shrink into, oh, I'm just, you know, I don't want to diminish being, you know, a wife and mother because that's important. Um, but if I'm not mistaken, I think all of the first ladies were wives and mothers. Um, and so I'm probably mistaken about some older ones, but in recent history. Um, and that seemed to kind of just be the focus of their lives, their children and um, and their husbands who are president. But she really, le- you know, we knew that she had these advanced degrees as she was working on like Let's Move and the uh, community garden that they had at the White House. Like all of that was in specific alignment with policy goals that she wanted to see. And so it didn't feel fluffy and you know, just kind of off to the side, like she was actually trying to advance an agenda. And you saw that she was doing that because Republicans went crazy. I mean, the things that they were saying about what she was trying to do to school lunch and, you know, just ridiculousness. And Shaniqua, just to put a fine point on it. And the first thing that the Republicans did when they took office fucking Donald Trump was destroy 
school lunches and everything she stood for. Like it was really like, yeah, get, I mean, it's kids, giving kids vindictive yeah. little shits. <laughs> like, really yes. Come on. <laughs> it's like not cool, Petty. It's just like wait, you're going to like no, take this out on the grouch. children. Yeah, exactly. and I'm sure none of these people have had to suffer through a school lunch. Y'all remember those Thank rectangle you. pizzas? I know. And, uh, the, the little frozen pepperoni. fruit cups. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my god. We and that was a something. highlight of the week for me. Oh, oh, you like the rectangle pizza? Totally. pizza? Oh my bad. Square pizza off. day, please. <laughs> no, they no, dude, they were awful. But it was the best thing out of everything else. <laughs> yes, fair. No, there was also chicken cutlet and mashed potato day, but that was you not. Got that was not every potatoes? week. We yeah. didn't get that well, where I live. <laughs> Idaho spuds, girl. Idaho spuds. <laughs> my grandma was a lunch lady in my school when I was yes, like in early awesome. elementary school. And I thought it was so awesome that my grandma was a lunch lady. And my grandpa was a janitor. So I thought it was like love so cool because I got to see them every day. And like when I would say, oh, I, yeah. you know, nice. every, everyone would say, hi, hi, janitor Jim, because his name was Jim. And I would <laughs> say, hi, grandpa. And I was like, I'm the coolest one. I'm related to the <laughs> Period. janitor. Um, Period. My, my grandma, when she was there, did try to make... Did to, to try to put a little zhuzh on the school lunch. We had like <laughs> chicken. Hey. But it still was cool. Man, the <laughs> foundation was the same. <laughs> See the Can public I... service Michelle Obama was trying to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Period. So one other um, political spouse I want to emphasize and name is Erin Reed. Uh, she is a journalist, a trans activist, and just happens to be the fiance of Montana Representative um, Zoe Zephyr. And I got to interview her recently and the the, my favorite part about that was how Aaron was a direct mirror of the values, the principles, the ideals that Zoe also represents in her work. And the other part that I loved is it emphasized how important the dynamic is between a politician and their partner and their spouse, because that's where you see some real behind the scenes shits come out. Like, so while you have Aaron and Zoe as a positive example of that, I think about the way that Melania Trump would swat away Trump's hand every time he tried to get close to her, every time she rejected a kiss from that cretin. Like, that's what comes to my mind, because that lets you know exactly Exactly the vibe behind the scenes but also back to um Casey DeSantis I'm like oh you don't trip and fall in love with a white supremacist anti-trans homophobic man like you have to have some alignment there so I think yeah, we should be asking choices. those questions too well mm -hmm. and so much alignment because he has no charisma and seems like the least Zero. charming He's person on the planet so <laughs> he did not like court her or go seek her out and hit on her and make her feel excited she saw an opportunity I don't want to prescribe what <laughs> oh! Just go there. No, don't back down now. Stand on it, Shaniqua. You're going somewhere. I like well, I it. I think it was very clear. She saw where he was headed and said, oh, this looks good for me. And look, it's totally fine to choose a spouse based on what you want out of life. And if you have ambitions to be the spouse of a, um, you know, a politician, that's great. But I'm sure there were so many she could have chose from. Like, she's a really beautiful Period. woman. Um, mm. And she chose DeSantis. But maybe it is because he has no personality and she would have been able to you know, have a bit more <laughs> And now but she's the secret weapon. Yes. Yeah, well, she's not a secret weapon anymore. She's just a <laughs> plain old weapon. weapon. Alyssa, what are your favorite political spouse uh, moments? Yeah, so obviously... I got to spend a long time with Michelle Obama, who has famously spoken about how she didn't like her husband for 10 years. So those were great times. Gag. Those were great Every times. time I hear it, gag. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. But so obviously, Erin knows I always weirdly go down rabbit holes. And when I was like, who's like an interesting political spouse that we didn't really know about, but we should? Rebecca Latimer Felton from the great state of Georgia. She was the first woman senator. Wait for it. She ran. Her husband was a senator. He had, uh, she ran his campaign. She wrote his speeches. She did all the work. And people came to know her as so smart and and savvy that when another senator died, she was appointed. And she essentially opened up like the the political spouses originally, if they ever came to Congress, they were all widows. So from like 1916 to like 1993, widows had an 84% chance of being elected 
once they filled their spouse's dead seat. Whereas a woman who was not there, no, was not a widow, only had a 14% chance of winning. Whoa. So Rebecca Latmer Felton, thank uh. you for paving the way for widows who could pave the way for yeah. other women to run All that's Congress. blaring in my mind right now is like, yeah, women do outlive men. So if you do the I math, know. like just, just survive him. Like, <laughs> Mary, Mary Young. Um, someone else I just wanted to bring up really quick because I think it really demonstrates the impact that um, spouses can have on you, both good and bad. Elizabeth Edwards, like now, oh. obviously. Oh, my God. <laughs> Buckle yeah. up. Rest in peace. Yeah, yes. Rest in peace. John Edwards was the villain there. He did all the bad stuff, cheating on her, having a baby outside of their marriage when she's like, you know, dying of cancer. But he will never be able to return to political life because everyone knows what he did to her and how he treated his spouse. So, you know, I I think when people, especially when it's a beloved spouse, if uh, the politician is acting up, it can literally ruin their career. Mm -hmm. Period. I mean, Jackie Kennedy. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Let's get into um, what I think we've all been waiting for, which was like the low notes on uh, partners. I, I want to start by by throwing to you, Shaniqua. I was just thinking because Mike Pence on uh, on Wednesday oh, yeah. declared, his, declared his candidacy for president in 2024. Mike Pence, who once famously tweeted the mis- at, uh, misattributed Ronald Reagan quote, um, what was it? The, the best place, the, the best thing for the inside of the man is an out, the outside of a horse, which is like a quote Ugh. that was, it was, yeah, yeah. It's a real reality much? Like, that's, what? Yeah, that's just, like, <laughs> right, but it's not it's like even a, a thing Ronald Reagan Pegasus. said. So not only is it a like Tobias Funke style, like, oh, <laughs> what did you mean by that? Um, it is a, not, Ronald Reagan didn't say that. He might have said it, but somebody else originally said it. Anyway. Um, Pence is so stupid. He's so awful. <laughs> He is so awful. But his partner, his wife, um, I don't even remember. Karen Pence. Of course her name's yeah, Karen. Yeah, she, would, mm-hmm. not, she would not like being Mother. called his partner. Yeah, right. Uh. Right. She didn't go to wife school for 15 years to not be called <laughs> wife. Um, she. This is actually, um, Mike is actually her second husband. Karen Pence. Oh, not. What? No, that. more. Yeah. I want the tea. Did her first husband believe in abortion? Well, he did. Be- well. Her first husband did believe in Cialis because her first husband was actually an executive at the uh, pharmaceutical company that developed Cialis. So he helped oversee the development of Cialis. So so wait, wait, wait. To Shaniqua's point about uh, choosing your political spouse, like tell me how she jumped from pharmaceutical, get it up Cialis man to Mike Pence who puts mother before all else. Like I don't get (laughs) it. I just got to say, maybe she was tired. Maybe she was tired. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it seems like Dead. she's probably getting lots of rest now, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I feel as though, you know, during the during 2020, the, the campaign, there were moments when it felt as though the Trump campaign was like, uh-oh, everybody hates this. All the women hate Donald Trump and uh, Melania is completely unrelatable to most people in this country. Uh, let's try to get, like, Karen Pence front and center and she sort of isn't really that uh, she doesn't really have a ton of riz either um so it was sort of just kind of not it kind of fell flat um uh, Shaniqua I wonder what you make of Pence entering the fray and if Karen Pence is like the type of person who seems like she has any sort of positive impact on Mike um no if I remember correctly she did not want him to be Donald Trump's running mate to begin with and so I think it's clear he doesn't listen to her. Um, so I think having your political spouse listen to you is a really important first step for being, you know, an impactful political wife or, or spouse. But no, I mean, she, their whole relationship is weird. I'm not just putting that on her, but like she has to be there for it to be a weird relationship. And I think people are just always like, what is going on there? The whole he can't be in a room with a woman by himself. That is strange. And I don't know if he's described that as like being deferential to her or respectful to her. But how are you going to be president if you can't be in a room with a woman by yourself, which to me says there will be no woman in leadership in your administration. And, you know, is she cool with that? Um, And, and I feel like she, I could be wrong. Does she want to be in the public 
presence like that. I mean, I've seen Melania, despite it seeming like she did not want to be anywhere near the White House. We saw her. I don't remember mm-hmm. seeing Karen Pence a lot. And I feel like I, I see Doug I only Inhoff remember her <laughs> yeah. very distinct blowout at the last convention. <laughs> what? Remember? She got a glow up before the convention. Oh, and you I was said like, blow oh. out. I'm thinking cat fight. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Blow out from I mean, your like hair. Her hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I remember because she gave us nothing else to remember. <laughs> Bless. <laughs> you saying that is make me, making me try to remember Sarah Palin's husband. I don't know. There's like my mind somehow got to Sarah Palin from you saying blow out. Her ex-husband. Yes, but now I can't even remember him. He was, if you could just imagine... Like a guy who would, mm, I'm trying to think, a guy who would wear like a, like a, a snowmobile branded jacket. <laughs> like yes, that guy. Like he's, that's, I guess I grew up in the North uh, where we had like lots of snowmobiles and like snowmobile, there was a specific type of like snowmobile guy with like a specific snowmobile goatee, you know, like wrap around shades, Twitter guys. I see it. I see yeah, it. he sort of looks like like on the top end of the good looking version of that. And that good looking version of that is still not very good looking. So that's uh, yeah, that's what he kind of looks like. Um, and, you know, it's funny because every time I, I went to this um, like a pro-life women's luncheon at the Republican Did you? convention. And I was <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, I was. Uh, I was having an abortion there. Uh, no, I was covering it in 2012. I did have an abortion like a week and a half later after that. So it didn't do a very Plus, good job. Um, you know. Huh. So I was at this, yeah, I was at this luncheon and there were all of these like heavy hitter pro-life Republican women like Pam Bondi. Remember the the um, AG of Florida who was like completely in Trump's pocket. Mm-hmm. Michelle Bachman was there. Um, oh, I forgot about her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. R- remember her? And uh, there were a few more, but every single one of them did this thing that Phyllis Schlafly used to do, famous anti-equal uh, rights amendment crusader. But Phyllis Schlafly, before she gave public speeches, would sometimes, as a way to like troll feminists, say, I would like to thank my husband for giving me permission to be here today. And all of the women at the pro-life luncheon did that. And they all thought they were like so clever. And it was like, I mean, I feel as though, and I could be wrong here, that when the candidate, it, it when we're talking about hetero couples, when the candidate between them is the woman, I don't think the their male partner has as much of an advisory role as when the candidate is the man. And I think it's because it's easier to be elected, and in some places, it's e- it's an easier path to power if like the man is just the one who does it, you know, instead of the woman. Does that sound like it? Well, I feel yeah. I feel like the men get to opt out if they're a spouse. That part, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Like like I feel like they get to opt out, and the the women are just either so criticized one way or another that you either pr- participate to defend sort of your place in this. Uh, nightmare or you know you're screwed but like who fucking scrutinized Doug Emhoff yeah yes sorry I couldn't guys I even spaced on his last name um (laughs) or like Amy Klobuchar's husband when she ran for president like the when the women Kirsten Gillibrand's husband like who remembers him yeah I I mean not because he's not because they're not like, right, not because they're man. not. <laughs> yeah. But like, but you know, it's not the same as the fact that we all know who Ron DeSantis' wife is right now. It does make me think that there are a lot of this kind of notion or the pitches your old boss would put down, Aaron, could be alleviated by having more LGBTQ and, you know, queer couples who are one, either not following any type of heteronormative standards and type of gender identities, or two, fully firm in their identities as just a human being. Because once mm-hmm. we get to that part, that could alleviate a lot of this tension. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. I mean, Pete Buttigieg has kind of experienced some of the scrutiny. Pete and his and his uh, husband have experienced some of the same scrutiny that you see applied to like for like Hillary Clinton. And and I wonder, Shaniqua, what, what do you what do you make of that? Yeah, I was just going to bring up when um, I don't remember who was criticizing Pete Buttigieg, but when he took paternity leave because they oh, had yeah. just had. You know exactly who was criticizing and- him over <laughs> that. And it wasn't was Democrats. Definitely- <laughs> 
it was definitely Republicans. I don't remember the specific person, but all I kept thinking was, oh, they have put Chastin in the woman's role and they think that that is who is supposed to be taking care um, of, of the babies. But in reality, one, men should be taking off time to take care of their newborns. But two, you know, even when you have two men, people were trying to force them into kind of uh, traditional um, gender roles as if this was a couple with a woman and a man. And, you know, it was it was just really interesting to see that even if we are given a high profile political gay couple, the political system will still say we only recognize one form of being and you're not fitting into it. So we're going to criticize you for it. Yeah. I remember some really gross like, oh, what's Pete going to do on paternity leave? Is he going to breastfeed? And it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell me you've what? never looked up. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. tell Crazy me you've never stuff. looked after an infant without telling me. You've never actually looked after an infant. They need more than that. Yes. They, like, <laughs> right. And it was like well known at the time, too, that one of the twins was had a health issue and was in the NICU. And so it's like for people to just come out and be like, no, oh, when is it? Oh, it's so trashy. It's disgusting. It's trashy. Yeah, it's it's pretty gross. Um, so I we're kind of like as, as much as Alyssa, you and I have been like, no, just give us twenty twenty three before we're another in another presidential election. It does feel like we're sort of starting to get into a time when it's just going to be a really annoying. 12 to 15 months you know it's starting to get into full swing there are so many of them it's there are already two conventions this week it's like god's sake god help oh, yeah. us wait there's conventions this week For yeah what? north carolina yes, and georgia gop oh god what are they what are they gonna do who cares straw polls <laughs> <laughs> which also i think what year was it 2008 that fucking Michelle Bachman won the Iowa straw poll. So yeah, yeah. I do feel really like crazy. we can gloss over this part of this part of the process. Yeah, <laughs> it was like I remember Ron Paul winning the CPAC straw poll like five years in a row or something like that. It's like, come on, guys, that's not yeah. okay, guys. What would you like to see throughout this next? Um, whether or not we're going to get it is another issue. But what would you like to see throughout this next election cycle uh, when it comes to the way that we talk about? political partners and spouses. I think just talk about them like they're they're people. You Definitely. know, I mean, yeah. it's like when you talk about like the thing I hate so much about the secret weapon is because what they're doing is saying that this candidate has shortcomings, but we're going to put it on their spouse to make up for those shortcomings or blame them when the whole thing goes up in flames. Like it is the most unfair position. If you gave me the choice, I would rather be the politician than the political spouse any day of the week. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, yeah. we all know that that will never happen unless I run for town council. <laughs> I'm like, what are we but talking about now? Is this I'm never giving up my pot, ladies. I'm never giving up my pot. <laughs> Shaniqua, how about you? I got to be honest, I would like some like, uniformity like either we're talking about everyone's spouse or we're talking about no one's um and it seems like you know you have people like tim scott who's not married so if he doesn't have a spouse to talk about let's not talk about anyone's spouse let's not talk about his sex life either like i don't want to hear any imagine more about when he lost his virginity it's like it's none of my business wait was that all. a fucking thing is that known like 40 something Wait, 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 wait. Why did why is that public information? <laughs> I saw that. Where did that come from? I know who asked that. No. Well, no, no, let's not Google. No Google. Yes. <laughs> Yikes. We are not we're going not down that, that fucking rabbit hole. You not know I can't stop myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alyssa, you yeah. absolute monster. What I would like to see is I, I was thinking about how um Early in Biden's presidency, I think, uh, people on the right were just really going to town about Dr. Jill Biden being called Dr. Jill Biden because she was a doctor in a discipline that wasn't something that involves like, you know, diagnosing diseases like she is, She has a different. I just found that to be so bad faith and stupid and like a smokescreen for attacking it was just it was just mean and for and no re and it was it was cruel and stupid and it and sexist, yes. And it was a way to, uh, I felt like there was something behind what everybody was saying and we all saw what it was and it was just like gross and weird and bad. And I think that sometimes people 
I don't want to both sides this because the right wing is completely out of control and immature and ridiculous. But I think that it, we don't really gain anything regardless of our ideology if we um, f- like fall into these little shit storms about first spouses that really have nothing to do with their spouse's ability to lead. Um, yeah. Like, I didn't mention KZ uh, DeSantis's gloves she wears everywhere. I actually think they're kind of cool. Like, <laughs> your hands, your they're hands very can... very weird to me. <laughs> your hands Wait, can... I think it... I wonder the motivation, though. Is it because she's a germaphobe? Like, is that what this is about? Well, your hands yeah, that'd be fair. can... Um, a lot of people... Like, back in the day, you would wear, like, gloves on your hands as a lady because having, like, youthful hands was almost as important as, like, having a young-looking complexion. So, like, oh. she might just be trying to, like, <sighs> keep her hands looking young or... I don't know. But also, who cares? Also, who cares? You know, it's like... Right. It has no- like it's we all make fashion choices that the general public, if they were scrutinizing them, would be like, what is she doing? Um, and s- that's just one for her. So, I mean, it's kind of fun to be like, oh, look at this dumb thing that like Melania did or whatever. But like, I just don't want it to suck all the oxygen out of the room in 2024. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, and the fact that like these candidates are who need to be covered. I mean, they are the ones who have these platforms. They're advancing crazy stuff. Like, let's talk about them. I mean, I I mean, what do we actually gain from that Politico piece? Not much. We don't get to talk about, you know, I mean, this was said in, in the other article um, that you all shared. Was it The Atlantic? Um, it was like The was Nation. A, oh, The Nation. Yeah. Was, yeah. Joan, Joan Walsh wrote it. Yeah. I mean, if if Casey was, you know, whipping votes for these awful bills and yeah, I definitely want to know that. But if if she's just kind of there and advising, I mean, what's wrong with that? I would hope that a spouse knew their political spouse well enough to offer some insight into how they can run a successful campaign. Like, that's not crazy to me. Yeah, I agree. Well, that's a good note to end things on. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about political spouses again as we move, as we plod Uh, as we sulk trudge trudge (laughs) (laughs) as we trudge toward 2024